Good morning. Welcome back from summer. And uh, we, this is uh, a, joint, uh, a joint hearing of the Women's Committee, the Justice Services Committee, Justice Systems Committee, and the Criminal Justice Committee. Um, before we start today's hearing, we're going to vote on one piece of legislation sponsored by Councilmember Drom relating to the operations of the Department of Correction. I want to note that we have been joined by a number of members of the committees and other council members, including Council Member Andy Cohen, Council Member Carlina Rivera, Council Member Alika Ampri Samuel, Chair of the Women's Issues Committee, uh, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, which I note has two L's in her name here, uh, Council Member Rory Lansman, Chair of the Justice Committee, Council Member Drom, Council Member Bob Holden, and Council Member Ben Kalos. Uh, the bill that we are going to vote on would require, intro 447, would require the Department of Corrections to submit quarterly reports on emergency lock-ins within DOC facilities, including information on the number of such emergency lock-ins, the, the reason and duration of such emergency lock-ins, and the extent to which mandated service to incarcerated individuals were disrupted during those lock-ins. During lock-ins, incarcerated individuals are not able to access important or necessary services, such as attorney, attorney or family visits, medical treatment, the law library, showers, or recreation. Reporting on emergency lock-ins will help the council to monitor the rate at which lock-ins prevent incarcerated individuals from receiving necessary services. This bill would take effect immediately after it becomes law, except that certain provisions relating to reporting of emergency lock-ins, continuous lock-ins by facility, and continuous lock exceeding 24 hours would take effect no later than 60 days following the end of the quarter beginning July 1st, 2019. The committee has previously held a hearing on this bill on April 23rd, 2018, received testimony from representatives of the, of the Department of Corrections and other advocates, uh, and as well as the unions, the advocates, the Board of Corrections, and other interested members of the public. So before we start and, and ask uh, folks to testify, uh, we are going to take a very quick vote for the members of the Criminal Justice Committee. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. And, uh, and the sponsor of the bill, Councilmember Drom, is going to uh, just make a quick statement on his, his bill. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Powers, uh, for this opportunity to speak on the legislation, on my legislation. Uh, unlock, unscheduled lock-ins are disruptive to the functioning of our jails and troubling for their impact on incarcerated individuals and visitors. Gathering information is a critical first step to addressing the problem. I want to express my gratitude to Council Staff Daniel Adays, Josh Kingsley, and Rob Calandra for ensuring that Introduction 447A reflects the strongest language possible. The data that will be collected will be very helpful to us here, as well as the advocates closely monitoring the unfolding reforms in our jails. Chair Powers, thank you for your efforts to keep such reform continuing and for your leadership during these hearings. And finally, I want to recognize Speaker Johnson for ensuring that the Council remains the driving force within city government when it comes to transforming our criminal justice system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you please call the roll call on the vote? William Martin, Committee Clerk, Roll Call Vote Committee on Criminal Justice, Introduction 447A, Chair Powers. Aye. Lanceman. Aye. Ampri Samuel. Aye. Holden. Rivera. Aye. By vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstention, item has been adopted by the committee. Great. Thank you. So now we will move on to our uh, joint oversight hearing. I am still Keith Powers, and I'm still the chair of the Criminal Justice Committee. Uh, this is a joint oversight hearing, as I mentioned, of the Criminal Justice, Justice System, and Women's Committees on the important topic of sexual abuse and harassment in New York City jails. I want to thank my co-chairs here, Chair Rosenthal and Chair Lansman, along with all of their staff, for holding this hearing today with, with the members of the Criminal Justice Committee. Uh, we believe that we as a city have a duty to make sure that all people, in Christ, incarcerated or not, are safe from sexual vi victimization. In the past few years, we have seen victim advocates, the Department of Justice, the Board of Corrections, and the media raise concerns about the prevalence of sexual abuse in our city jails. Just last week, a lawsuit was filed in federal court accusing New York City of fostering a culture of systemic rape at Rikers. <laughs> and as we look forward to the closure of Rikers Island, we must not only address this issue in front of us, but also, also ensure that we do not replicate any of these same mistakes in future borough-based facilities. The Department of Correction, who is here joining us today, issued its first annual report on sexual abuse in jails in March, 
which revealed that from 2016 to 2017, the number of allegations of sexual abuse has gone up by roughly 40%. Even more alarming is the fact that as of June, the total caseload for the department was 2,275 cases for just 19 investigators. That data showed that 94% of the cases classified under the Prison Rape Elimination Act, commonly known as PREA, were past their 90-day deadline for being investigated. We know that one cause of past uptics in allegations has to do with increased reporting, and it is a good thing, we believe, if more incarcerated individuals are coming forward. We also know that DOC is trying to address this problem in part by hiring more staff to, to, to do investigations and to investigate incidents of past sexual abuse in jails. And in fact, a report released last month showed an overall decrease of pre-allegations of sexual abuse by 31 percent, comparing the last six months of 2017 to the first six months of 2018. But the lag in investigations and continued prevalence of sexual abuse despite what appears to be a reduction in overall allegations, continues to be extremely high. And these results, we believe, are concerning, both to me, to the Council, and to the committees, and to the to the committees here today, and to the public. And uh, to note that opinions may differ among stakeholders about how we can eliminate sexual assault and abuse in jails, but we all want incarcerated individuals, those guarding them and their visitors, to feel safe and secure in city facilities. I, look, I thank and look forward to working with the Department of Corrections and the Board of Corrections, who are both here today, to figure out how we can reach that goal. In particular, I am interested in exploring how we can resolve the backlog and resol unresolved cases, discussing how we can better protect transgender individuals and other vulnerable, vulnerable populations in our city jails, as well as how we can make sure the right procedures are in place when an investigation is conducted to ensure a timely and fair resolution where everybody feels safe. We will be also hearing two pieces of legislation today. The first is Councilmember Cumbo's Introduction 933, a law to amend the administrative code to require the Department of Correction to report on sexual abuse. Uh, this will help ensure that DOC is held accountable to both the public and the Council in comb combating sexual abuse in jails. And the second piece is Councilmember Drom's Introduction 1090 to require the Department of Correction to re report on sexual abuse of visitors. Uh, both these bills are, we believe, extremely important to provide more information to us and to the public and to ensure better monitoring of those who are inside and visiting our city jails. With that said, I want to thank the administration, the Department of Corrections, and the Board of Corrections for all being here today. I want to thank the Commissioner for joining us and my staff and the staff of all the committees here for helping to put this together, the chairs for, uh, the chairs for joining us, and all the council members in attendance. I also want to welcome our new council here at her first hearing on such an important topic. With that uh, being said, I will pass it along to Chair Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Powers. I'm Helen Rosenthal. I chair the Committee on Women. Chair Powers outlined the reasons why we are here today. I want to highlight especially the ways in which the status quo is a fundamental failure of gender equity and justice. Sexual violence itself is inextricably linked to questions of gender and power. The crisis of sexual assault in prisons and jails is an especially stark and disturbing manifestation of this dynamic for all those affected, whether they are an incarcerated person, a visitor, or a corrections officer. Among incarcerated individuals, as in society as a whole, women, trans, and gender nonconforming individuals are disproportionately victimized by sexual violence. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics 2011 and 12 survey, 5% of women reported sexual violence compared to 3.3% of men. For trans and gender nonconforming individuals, the crisis is dramatically more acute. The Bureau of Justice Statistics found that nationally more than 34% of incarcerated trans individuals had experienced sexual victimization. For men too, sexual violence in jails is inextricably linked to questions of gender. The way in which prison rape is made light of in popular culture is an example of how standards of masculinity and homophobia create additional barriers for cis men who are victimized. 
In New York City, we are confronted with all these issues. The Rose M. Singer Center, which houses the vast majority of women in the custody of the Department of Correction, is consistently among the least safe, not just in, is among the least safe facilities, not just in New York, but in the country. The Bureau of Justice Statistics most recently conducted a facility-specific review of sexual violence in correctional facilities. At that time, in 2011-12, uh, 8.6 percent of incarcerated individuals at Rose M. Singer Center reported having experienced sexual victimization, either by a staff member or another incarcerated person. This was the highest of any jail in New York City or New York State, and the third highest in the entire country. Based on the available data and based on the stories of survivors, the fundamental dynamic described at the Singer Center has not significantly changed in the years since that national study in 2011. The Department of Corrections most recent report, released in August, showed that more complaints of sexual abuse came from those incarcerated at the Singer Center than any other facility. While women make up just 6% of incarcerated individuals, nearly 22% of er allegations originated from the Singer Center from July 2017 to June 2018. DOC does not publish data on whether allegations were made by trans or cisgender incarcerated individuals. But every indication is that we are failing to keep them safe as well. In a report issued earlier this year, the Board of Correction found that 35% of applicants to the transgender housing unit reported that they had previously experienced prior harassment, threats, attacks, or abuse in custody, and 8% were experiencing and 8% were experiencing it at the time of the survey. The implication of this data is clear. We are not doing nearly enough to keep trans individuals safe at Rikers Island. The Department of Corrections response to this violence has been bluntly inadequate. While more than 500 complaints were filed from July of 2017 to June of 2018, one full year, not a single complaint was deemed fully substantiated. On its face, this is an unbelievable finding. What all this adds up to is a continuing crisis of sexual violence for those who are under the custody of the Department of Correction, as well as for visitors and for the corrections officers themselves. As chair of the Committee on Women, I've made combating sexual harassment and sexual assault a top priority. Too often in doing so, I have seen institutions shirk their responsibility to prevent sexual violence, choosing to minimize blame rather than accept responsibility. Let me be clear about my expectations for this hearing. I am not interested in playing games with numbers or in hearing bureaucratic excuses. The efforts to implement the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards, or PREA, have been inadequate. In December of 2015, the Department of Correction testified before this very body and announced that it had, quote, a plan over the next two years to be able to implement PREA across the agency and have our facilities go through audits to become PREA compliant, end quote. That was 2015. It's three years later. And plainly, that has not happened. What I want to hear today is a clear acknowledgement of the continuing problem 
and a specific commitment to real solutions. This is exactly the right time to make such a commitment. We are currently on the momentous path to closing Rikers Island. Closing Rikers has never merely been a matter of facilities. It's about transforming the institution of detention itself, replacing it with something more humane and more just. The process of creating new facilities is an opportunity to take into account some of the larger institutional challenges we face in keeping incarcerated individuals safe. It must include consideration of how to keep incarcerated individuals safe from sexual violence. The design must also ensure that all survivors are able to safely and confidentially file complaints and access support services. The design of the new facilities are just one example of why we must use this moment to confront the horror of sexual violence within the Department of Correction. I look forward to today's hearing as an opportunity to concretely discuss this and other ways in which we can seek to eliminate sexual violence for all those who interact with New York's correction system. With that, I want to thank the staff of the Committee on Women, including Council Brenda McKinney, Policy Analyst Chloe Rivera, Legal Fellow Rabia Kasim, and Finance Analyst Daniel Krupp for all of their help in preparing for this hearing, as well as my Legislative Director, Sean Fitzpatrick. Thank you. Thank you, and I think we're going to hear from Council Member and Chair Rory Lanson. Thank you, and good morning. I'm Council Member Rory Lanceman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and thank you to Council Member Keith Powers and uh, Council Member Helen Rosenthal for leading this important hearing. The Department of Corrections Annual Sexual Abuse and Sexual Harassment Assessment Report, released last month, shows that there were a total of 561 allegations of sexual victimization from July 2017 to June 2018. Sexual victimization encompasses allegations against both staff and other inmates and includes everything from staff voyeurism to unwanted touching to sexual assault to rape. The Rose M. Singer Center, known as Rosie's, the jail specifically dedicated to women housed at Rikers had 123 of those allegations, the most of any single facility. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the women represented only 6% of the Rikers population in FY18. Women at Rosie's represented at least 22% of the allegations. However, this is where our information about sexual victimization of women in the Department of Correction facilities ends. DOC's primary report on sexual assault doesn't break their statistics down by gender. We know that allegations from Rosie's come from women, but what of transgender women who have not historically been housed at Rosie's, or women held at another facility because of a medical condition? Further, it, it's impossible to say, based on the report, what kind of allegations women made. The difference between voyeurism and rape is enormous, but we have no idea how many women, or even just those held at Rosie's, made allegations of either. What we know, if a full account were given, is that it would demonstrate how dramatically overrepresented the women of Rosie's are in reported rapes, abuse, and harassment by staff. According to a 2013 Department of Justice study, 5.9% of women at Rosie's reported being sexually abused by staff, three times the national average. And I say reported because that is really all we have to go on. In the last year, from July, 17, from July 2017 to June 2018, despite there being 561 allegations of sexual abuse and sexual harassment, not one was substantiated. That means there was not one case, not one inappropriate touch, not one assault, not one rape that investigators found was more likely than not to have happened. 
That is obviously a failure in our investigatory system because that is simply impossible. And that isn't even getting into the hundreds of allegations from previous years that are backlogged and remain unresolved. <clears throat> it's important not to miss the forest for the trees. We can't talk about sexual violence at Rikers, specifically Rosie's, without talking about why there are so many women there in the first place. Based on rough estimates, it is likely that in 2017, nearly 1,000 women were held pretrial for some period of time on a non-violent felony charge. No one should be sitting on Rikers Island just because they cannot make bail. But it is an additional sickening indictment of our bail and pretrial release system that women who should not be there in the first place are also being exposed to some of the highest rates of sexual abuse by staff in any jail or prison in the country, and that women remanded on more serious violent felonies, serving city sentences, or awaiting the resolution of a warrant or parole violation, those who are kept at Rikers by more than just poverty, are not protected from victimization by the very system that also keeps them locked up. So today's hearing is about specific failures to prevent, investigate, and meet out justice for the sexual abuse and harassment visited upon the individuals at Rikers, but it is also about the general failures of locking people up at Rikers in the first place. And the truth is we must do better on both fronts. Thank you. Thank you, and I just know we have uh, the two bill sponsors here. We've also been joined by one of the bill sponsors, Councilmember Cumbo. Um, I know Councilmember Drum wanted to make a quick statement on his bill, and then we'll offer an opportunity as well for Councilmember Cumbo. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chair Powers. Imagine being stripped, groped, humiliated, forcibly touched, and even penetrated, all in a setting where, you're, where you are almost completely powerless. According to an extensive investigation by WNYC and The Intercept, this is exactly what many visitors to our jails have to endure to see their loved ones. As of November 2017, the Jails Action Coalition has identified at least 45 women who have filed or are in the process of filing lawsuits that accuse the DOC of unlawful strip searches, most of them at Rikers. These strip searches still seem to be happening now in bathrooms in the central visit house, out of sight from surveillance cameras. One of the officers who was accused of sexual abuse has reportedly been promoted to the DOC investigations team. Sadly, such incidents simply compound the massive injustices family members, friends, and professionals face trying to see detained individuals. Violations by law enforcement, including rape, sexual assault, and sexual harassment, are especially traumatizing for victims. There is a massive power imbalance that can facilitate the access of sexual perpetrators to their victims. That same power dynamic can be used to humiliate and silence victims after they are violated. Intro 1090 seeks to gain a better understanding of the problem and what the Department of Correction is doing to prevent it. Sexual assault of jail visitors is so egregious since it combines a terrible crime with the fact that public servants who act in the public trust are perpetrating them. From the complaints and the lawsuits, it seems women are overwhelmingly the targets of, of, of assaultive searches. Rikers is a toxic environment, and it seems that women-identified visitors who are in extremely vulnerable positions are not immune from the horrors. It's a systematic design to put these women down, said the lawyer of one of the alleged victims, and I agree, it certainly does look that way. Only through a thorough, unbiased investigation can systemic issues be uncovered and addressed uh, because my perception, and I hope that the department uh, can correct me if I'm wrong, as uh, Council Member Rosenthal and uh, Council Member Lanceman have alluded to, is that virtually no perpetrators have been brought to justice. My bill attempts to get at the hard evidence of what the department is doing, which is up to now has been woefully inadequate. The visiting experience should be designed to ensure security for the facility while minimizing trauma to visitors. And I want to highlight something about security, which is often invoked to rationalize harsh visitor screenings. The sad truth is certain correction officers, not visitors, are the source of most contraband. We need to make it easy for people to visit the jails and to file and resolve complaints if a visit goes awry. Our efforts today will, I hope, bring our city closer to realizing this goal. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Councilmember Drum. Councilmember Combo, would you like to make a statement as well? Yeah. Thank you so much. It is certainly an honor to be here today because this is an issue that has been uh, swept under the rug for far too long. And in the age of the Me Too movement, it is critical that we make sure that sexual harassment ends in all places, whether it's in Hollywood or within our prisons, we have to make sure that our women are safe. We are confronted on a regular basis with our society's epidemic of sexual violence in the home, in workplace, and in public spaces. Advocates and leaders have worked hard to ensure that this public reckoning does not only achieve justice and uplift the stories of those who are white, rich, or famous. I commend their tremendous and long-standing efforts to ensure that the experiences of sexual violence of those at the margins are centered in the fight for dignity and justice. One group, as I stated in particular, whose safety and well-being is far too often let out of these conversations is that of individuals who are incarcerated. I applaud my colleagues, Chairs Rosenthal, Powers, and Lansman, for bringing us all here today to make it clear that the lives of those currently residing in our city's jails matter and that it is our responsibility to do everything that we can to respect and to protect their safety and well-being. The rates of sexual violence in our facilities are alarming and above national averages, as was stated. We can and we must do better. Individuals who are incarcerated often come into our facilities having already been victimized. 86% of women who are incarcerated have reported experiencing sexual violence in their lifetime. And we know that the LGBTQ individuals experience disturbing rates of violence as well. We cannot allow them to be re-victimized and with impunity under our watch. Our values of equity, fairness, and justice as a city must be applied to all New Yorkers. I am proud to bring forth today proposed intro 933A with my colleague, Councilmember Alika Amprey Samuel, to codify the current Board of Corrections rules on reporting of incidents of sexual abuse and ensure that DOC continues to report on sexual abuse and harassment in jails. I look forward to today's conversation, but more importantly, I look forward to action from this hearing. We have to learn more about the DOC's policies, their effectiveness or ineffectiveness, and where we need to improve. I thank all of those that are here today to testify for their time, insight, and tremendous work and partnership in this critical effort. And I thank all of you that are here today and found it not robbery in order to come here to speak up for those who have been marginalized and silenced, but are so deserving of our respect, our protection, and making sure that we come out with positive outcomes and not simply a hearing. Thank you. Thank you, thanks so much. And so we've been joined here by the commissioner and, and team from the Department of Corrections and we'll be hearing your testimony. Thanks, thank you for joining us. Uh, I think we have to swear you in first. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond on honestly to council member questions? I do. Great, thank you. Good morning, Chair Powers, Chair Lansman, Chair Rosenthal, and members of the Criminal Justice, Justice System, and Women's Committees. I am Cynthia Brand, Commissioner of the Department of Correction. I am joined by Bureau Chief of Security, Chief Canty, Deputy Commissioner of Investigations and Trials, Serena Townsend, Assistant Commissioner of Priya Fayalardi, as well as Dr. Zachary Rosner, Chief of Medicine for Health and Hospitals and Correctional Health Services. In 2015, the department put in place multiple top to bottom reform initiatives simultaneously in order to address the overall safety and security of everyone in our facilities. These reforms included implementing both the federal Nunez consent decree and PREA standards, as well as many other efforts. In our testimony today, we will focus on the current and planned efforts the department has undertaken in order to address the issue of sexual abuse and sexual harassment in our facilities. When I first came to the department three years ago, I took on the role of Deputy Commissioner of Quality Assurance, and by then the department had begun targeting this issue from multiple angles, including committing to bringing itself into compliance with the Federal Prison Rape Elimination Act, or PREA. 
Since then, we have worked collaboratively with experts in the field, including advocates and other city agencies to implement various operational elements, sweeping staff training initiatives and innovating housing strategy, strategies to move towards not only compliance with PREA, but broader, more comprehensive best practices that ensure everyone who enters our facilities, staff and inmates alike, remain safe. It is critically important that the department take every possible step in keeping people safe from abuse and harassment of any kind. Today, we will focus on the major areas of effort towards reducing and eliminating sexual abuse and sexual harassment while in the department's care. Assistant Commissioner Yerlardi of PREA will provide an overview of PREA and the department's efforts towards compliance over the past several years. And Deputy Commissioner Townsend will describe the many improvements the department has put in place to meet its investigatory obligations. And just as um, a note, um, <coughs> as a response to uh, chair's committees, I want you to know that both as a professional and a woman, this topic this situation is of the utmost importance to me and my staff. And the, the women sitting to my left and right um, were partially selected to fill their roles because they are former prosecutors that prosecuted sex crimes. And so um, I hope that instills a, a sense of confidence in our plan and our abilities to move this agency forward. And I'll turn it over now to Assistant Commissioner Yelard. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond on honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, Chair Powers, Chair Lansman, and Chair Rosenthal, and members of the Criminal Justice, Justice System, and Women Committee committees. I am Assistant Commissioner Faye Yolardi, the Assistant Commissioner for PREA. The Prison Rape Elimination Act is a federal statute that outlines the essential elements required to prevent the sexual abuse of inmates in correctional facilities. Finalized in 2012, it functions as a baseline for correctional facilities to standardize their approach to improving safety in this regard. The statute provides standards for both prisons and jails prevention planning, response planning, training and education, screening for risk of sexual victimization and abusiveness, reporting requirements and response protocols, investigations, discipline, medical and mental care, data collection and review, audits and appropriate corrective action and state compliance. In 2015, the Department of Correction announced it would voluntarily bring itself into compliance and work towards PREA certification for its facilities. Implementation began by working closely with the Moss Group, a nationally recognized expert in PREA, to outline a multi-year plan to bring the department into compliance. The road to compliance, I'm sorry, the road to implementation is long but the standards are broad and multifaceted and will achieve and we will achieve compliance in all of the department's facilities exclusive of the hospitals. One of the department's tools as it works towards PREA certification is the use of the Moss Group's mock audits, which are structured similarly to a formal PREA audit and are used to informally assess audit readiness and expectations. Following a mock audit, the Moss Group provides a concise report listing all of the standards with information about each standard's adequacy, and the report includes recommendations for improvements where needed. While the Moss Group's mock audit process mirrors an actual audit, certification of PREA compliance is conducted by a DOJ certified auditor. DOC's PREA efforts to date include implementing many reporting mechanisms including free calls to 311, a fully monitored and anonymous hotline, and contracting with an external victim advocacy organization that provides emotional support to sexual abuse victims. An extensive information campaign to ensure inmates are well informed of the many reporting avenues went into effect, including posters in all of the intake areas, housing units, 
and inmate common areas, and a PREA pamphlet is provided to all inmates entering custody. In the fiscal year 17 January plan, the department was funded for eight PREA compliance managers, which we also call PCMs, and has since hired seven individuals into these positions who play roles in the intake screening process, staff training, daily inmate orientation for all new admissions, sexual abuse incident reviews, and housing decisions. Additionally, each facility has designated uniform staff as a PREA ambassador to work on PREA initiatives and whose primary responsibilities include assisting with the intake screenings, staff training, and supporting the PCMs. PREA ambassadors function as PCMs in facilities where there are currently no PCMs. Together, these two roles function as the regular faces of PREA, providing inmates with all rules, policies, procedures, as it pertains to the department's zero tolerance policy for sexual abuse and sexual harassment. The department has successfully trained over 7,300 DOC staff members on PREA with training provided to all incoming recruits, and there are monthly scheduled trainings for all DOC non-uniform staff, contractors, and volunteers. This four-hour training is designed to be a concise, to be as concise as possible, while including a meaningful dis discussion that covers key areas of the PREA standards. The following topics are discussed. What is PREA and zero tolerance? PREA implementation in the New York City Department of Correction, the right to be free from sexual abuse and sexual harassment, the right to be free from retaliation for reporting sexual abuse and sexual harassment, prevention and detection, response and reporting, professional boundaries, and effective and professional communication on the job. While Correctional Health Services has been a part of this training effort from the beginning, in February 2018, CHS began conducting a PREA training designed specifically for its health staff in addition to required online specialized training. To date, CHS has trained over 1,000 staff members. As part of the PREA standard on responsive services, the department has posted coordinated response plans, which are written plans coordinating the actions taken by the facility, PREA team, medical staff, and in response to an incident of sexual abuse in every facility. If an allegation of sexual misconduct is made against a DOC staff member, the staff member is immediately separated from the housing, air, housing unit and CHS confidentially evaluates the patient to provide appropriate medical treatment and medical health services and a referral for forensic evaluation as warranted. As of February, 2018, the department began using a new screening process, which uses a questionnaire provided at intake to determine an inmate's risk of sexual victimization as part of the electronic screening tool. The department uses the responses to the questionnaire to determine the most appropriate housing options for that individual, with the goal of that person's safety as well as the safety of those around him or her at the forefront. During medical intake, CHS identifies patient, patients with a history of abuse and connects them to a sexual abuse advocate to provide appropriate counseling and connection to care and victim services through the Sexual Abuse Advocacy Program. CHS has conducted 312 initial counseling sessions with patients and 275 follow-up sessions. The SAA program is completely voluntary and patient-driven, and patients can request, accept, or decline these services. When patients are discharged from DOC custody, CHS offers referrals to community-based programs upon request. PREA compliance is measured at the individual facility level rather than at the department level. While DOC has implemented and implementing the PREA standards across the department, the audits will be conducted on a facility-by-facility -facility basis. The first facility will be Rose M. Singer, and they will be audited by a DOJ-certified reviewer in the spring of 2019. Pending the results 
of that audit, any corrective action will be taken immediately and lessons learned will be incorporated into the next facility's preparation for its audit, tentatively scheduled for the fall of 2019 until gradually all of the facilities are deemed BREA compliant. The department has engaged with multiple stakeholders, including its counterparts in CHS, who play a pivotal role in addressing all allegations of sexual abuse and sexual harassment. All CHS employees are expected to immediately report any allegations, actual knowledge of, or reasonable belief concerning sexual abuse or sexual harassment to CHS operators, who in turn are required to notify DOC for investigation. CHS works closely with DOC staff to ensure that all patients receive appropriate health and mental health care in cases of alleged, alleged or suspected sexual abuse or sexual harassment, regardless of where the, the reports are made. Additionally, the department and CHS have worked closely with the Board of Corrections whose minimum standards related to the elimination of sexual abuse and sexual harassment in DOC facilities went into effect in January 2017. These standards have greatly improved the department's reporting efforts and made the department more transparent on this issue. Many of the department's reports are now publicly available on the board's website. Finally, as announced in April 2018, the department is committed to complying with its modified waiver to Executive Order 16, which ensures that individuals can use facilities consistent with their gender identity. The department would house, will house individuals in court according to their gender identity and maintain the Transgender Housing Unit, which we also call THU, a unit designed to address the unique needs of transgender individuals in DOC custody as part of our ongoing efforts, the department conducted a comprehensive review of the THU's processes and, and implemented changes to streamline the application process, improve efficiencies, and reduce processing time for housing in the THU. The department will continue to work with the New York City Commission on Human Rights to align on principles of gender identity. A cornerstone of PREA implementation is a fair and thorough investigative process. And DC Townsend will provide you with additional information on the department's work there. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner Yolardi. Do I need to be sworn in? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Good morning, Chair Powers, Chair Lansman, Chair Rosenthal, and members of the Criminal Justice, Justice System, and Women Committees. I am Deputy Commissioner Serena Townsend, Deputy Commissioner of the Investigation and Trials Division. Upon receiving an allegation of sexual misconduct via one of the previously described reporting mechanisms, the investigation division begins the process of investigating the allegation. The department investigates all sexual harassment and sexual abuse allegations thoroughly within 72 hours of the allegation being reported. In those first 72 hours, PREA investigators will respond to the facility of the alleged incident and conduct their investigation. This will involve speaking with the inmate who made the allegation and any other potential witnesses reviewing Genetech video and phone calls, reviewing the inmate and staff backgrounds, collecting any other evidentiary paperwork, and then documenting all of these steps in a report. Critically, this also involves ensuring that the alleged victim is immediately separated from the alleged subject and that the alleged victim inmate receives mental health, victim services, and medical services. Any time an inmate alleges that he or she was sexually abused, the investigation division sends that information to the Department of Investigation for clearance to investigate. The Department of Investigation will either clear the case and allow us to investigate, or they will ask the department to stand down and they will take the case themselves. If the matter is cleared for our investigation, the investigation division assigns it to one of the 24 investigators now assigned to the PREA team. If during 
the investigation division's investigation, criminality is found, we will refer the case back to the Department of Investigation and or the District Attorney's Office. All sexual abuse and sexual harassment allegations are thoroughly investigated within 72 hours of the allegation being reported. However, as of June 2018, the Department had a backlog of 1,216 PREA reportable cases that had not yet been formally closed. A PREA reportable allegation is one that meets the definitions as delineated in the PREA standard. These PREA reportable allegations include staff on inmate consensual and non-consensual acts, staff on inmate sexual harassment, inmate on inmate non-consensual sex acts, inmate on inmate abusive sexual contact, and inmate on inmate sexual harassment. Because the investigation division is currently understaffed, and because all of the steps just described take time, it is not unusual for a PREA team investigator to get called out to another allegation before he or she is able to close an investigation. Therefore, despite having conducted the preliminary investigation and ensuring that the alleged victim is interviewed, separated from the alleged subject, and given all appropriate services, these cases often remain open. As of June 2018, the PREA team was comprised of 19 investigators, with each investigator averaging 95 cases and each case taking well beyond the board standard requiring all cases be closed within 90 days of an allegation being made. Because the team is in the process of hiring additional staff and because the investigation division adheres so firmly to the 72-hour rule, PREA investigators have been unable to close their cases in a timely fashion. By implementing new strategies, the investigation division has been able to make progress against our backlog. The department's main strategy is to add investigative and supervisory staff to the investigation division's PREA team and structure a workable timeline for the closure of backlogged cases. While the department interviews candidates, interim solutions were put into place. For example, in order to reduce the amount of time it takes to close out these already investigated cases, the department revised the PREA closing memorandum, making it more efficient and streamlined while still containing all relevant information. Streamlining the closing memo has helped reduce the amount of time each investigator must dedicate to the otherwise time-consuming paperwork involved in closing cases. Another interim strategy was to assign a PREA-certified supervisor from the trials and litigation team to close PREA-related cases, which has compounded the time-saving of the new expedited closing memorandum. Over 60 cases were closed in approximately 60 days using this interim strategy. The substantiation rate for PREA reportable cases at the Department of Correction in 2015 and 2016 was 6.5 percent, which is in line with national averages. According to a report by the Federal Bureau of Justice Statistics, substantiation rates for sexual abuse and sexual harassment allegations nationwide dropped from 10 percent substantiated in 2010 to 6 percent in 2015. Most importantly, neither of our interim strategies affects the quality of the investigations into allegations of sexual misconduct, which the department is committed to fully investigating and resolving. In fact, allegations involving 16, 17, and 18-year-old inmate victims are overseen also by the federal Nunez monitor. The federal monitor thoroughly reviews not only all of the department's use of force cases, but also these particular PREA cases for timeliness of closure and appropriateness of our evidentiary conclusions. The department has prioritized investigating PREA matters involving young inmates. And of this category of cases, only seven PREA reportable cases remain open. Also as part of the federal Nunez consent decree, the department has installed just under 13,000 cameras with full coverage of all housing units and ancillary areas in which inmates may be. These cameras have proven to be highly effective investigatory tools and may even act as deterrence to engaging in harmful behavior. In the FY 2019 executive budget, the department received additional positions for investigations division, specifically to enable the expansion necessary to support the work needed for both the Nunez use of force 
and PREA investigations. We have recently hired six new investigators specifically for our PREA team with plans to hire five more by early 2019. Additional supervisory staff will be added to the unit, including four supervising investigators and one deputy director. By early 2019, the PREA team will be comprised of 30 investigators, six supervising investigators, a deputy director, and a director. These staffing additions will greatly improve the speed with which the department is able to close cases. In fact, since adding the six new PREA investigators to the department in June of 2018, the investigation division has been able to close an additional 250 cases. The department is on target to meet its goal of clearing its backlog by early 2019. The department anticipates that once the backlog is fully cleared, investigators will carry a caseload of approximately 30 cases, allowing the department to achieve compliance with the board standards requiring cases be closed within 90 days of an allegation being lodged. Furthermore, the department remains committed to the regular reporting of investigations related data as required by the board's minimum standards. Regarding reporting, the department would like to take this opportunity to mention two pieces of proposed legislation, intro 1090 and intro 933A. For intro 1090, which proposes an annual report of the number of visitor complaints regarding sexual abuse, the department supports the intent of this legislation, pending clarification of some of the terms used. For intro 933A, the department similarly supports the intent of this legislation. However, we request that the reporting terms more closely align to other similar reporting requirements already in place, such as reporting on a biannual rather than quarterly basis. Finally, I would like to restate that the department has a zero tolerance policy for anyone, inmate, staff, or third party who commits sexual misconduct in its facilities and those found to have engaged in criminal behavior are subject to the fullest extent of the law in this regard. The department has undertaken major efforts over the past three years to address the issue of sexual assault and sexual harassment in its facilities, and significant progress can be noted. One assault or harassment is too many, but using the multifaceted approach we have just described, the department will continue its efforts to keep everyone who enters its facilities safe. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. And uh, we've also been joined by Councilmember Mizell and Councilmember Maiella as well. So we will, uh, I'm going to ask a few questions, and I know my colleagues here are uh, eager to ask many as well. Um, to start with, the reporting, which I want to start with, and what's getting reported, and which data we are getting and the public's getting access to, um, because I think that helps us inform what is happening and help us understand how we can be supportive of the work that you need to do. And I and I appreciate the um, uh, the, the mentality that z that zero is the goal, and um, but I would note that it's, it's, it strikes me that many of the things we're talking about are not preventative but are responding more investigators is great. It's, it's ensuring that we close the cases out in time, um, making sure that there are reporting mechanisms is great. But of course, the goal to get to zero includes much more than letting people report and have ways to report and also to get to, a, to get more investigators. In fact, zero means being preventative and, um, and not, of course, not looking at minimum standards, but really how we can ensure that all people are safe at all times. Um, on the, I just wanted to start because we're going to talk a lot about PREA and non-PREA. I certainly I can talk about the differences, but I, perhaps you guys can, I know you did in your testimony, you talked about PREA, but your reporting and your report, I think your biannual report, talks about two type, two categories with subcategories. And can you just for everybody's sake here, talk about what's required to be reported and also you just give us the, the definition difference in terms of PREA and non-PREA. So I want to reiterate that every allegation is taken seriously and investigated. 
the PREA allegations may differ from non-PREA allegations in that if it's a sexual harassment allegation, for example, if it's not a repeated sexual harassment allegation, then that allegation might be considered a non-PREA allegation, but it's still taken seriously and it's still investigated appropriately. Just, but just for, just for clarity's sake, mm -hmm. PREA is defined in the federal law the Prison Rape Elimination Act, non-PREA, those are allegations, those are one, considered one-time offenses that you're reporting voluntarily? Yes. Or you're not mandated? So we're taking those, the allegations defined, sexual harassment defined in the PREA standards and sexual abuse as defined in the PREA standards. Taking those allegations and those definitions and determining whether they're actual PREA cases or non-PREA cases. Okay. Um, uh, and, and so there, it was mentioned earlier that in the biannual report, you report on certain categories of uh, offenses, I think like sexual misconduct, and there's, I think there's five different categories, but they're not listed by particular, I'm not sure that they're listed by facility, but they're not listed by things, uh, by more specific categories. Is there, A, is there a reason that they're reported that way, and second, is it, is it possible in these reports to, um, to, to provide more clear information so that the public has a better understanding of what these offenses are? Sh sure, we, we try to model our reporting requirements based on the federal standards as well as the, the BOC rule, but if you want us to add additional categories, we can do that. Okay, we'll request it perhaps in writing so sure. we can be clear about it, but I think that that's one of the things in, in these reports is, is trying to get clear to what the what, what the problems are and what are the actual the actual issues and it's hard at times when it's unclear because of the categorization of them. So the the you mentioned the different ways that um, that you can one can report. Yes. Can you just list those for us again? All all the different ways that one can report? Sure. In place now we have a confidential hotline that um, individuals in our custody can call free of charge. Um, that is sent to, once we get those calls, that is sent to the investigation division. Uh, individuals can call 311, which is also free of charge to report. Um, they, we have Safe Horizon. We are contracted with uh, Safe Horizons, an uh, independent, um, confi confidential independent um, agency that also lets us know if they have received any reports. Um, CHS is also working in partnership with us. If they receive any allegations, they immediately send it to their operations and their operations uh, sends it to us for, for investigative uh, purposes. And then how do you make sure, how do you audit or ensure that all of those calls or complaints or reports end up in the investigations unit? Because certainly with that many, and I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that more seems to be good, people mm -hmm. should certainly will have fears about reporting to maybe one, one way and can have the other, can have an alternative, but how do we ensure that those, those end up at the right, they all, those all go to the investigations unit directly? They, they all go to the investigations unit. Um, for the confidential hotline, we do a tracking system and when we get either the call from somebody from the, on the phone or if we get an email indicating, a voicemail indicating that they're um, alleging an allegation, we immediately forward that allegation to the investigations division. The 311 process, they have a very extensive and intensive tracking mechanism that anytime they get an allegation, they send it immediately to the investigation division. It doesn't linger. Okay, and, and what's the highest resource that people are using in order to do, or how, what's the highest one that you're receiving? From 311. From 301. <laughs> yes. That's so somebody uses absolutely. a phone, where in whatever facility they're used, calls 311 and makes a report? Absolutely. And the, and, and are you working on ways to help reduce fears about reporting? Because certainly, to me, it strikes me that um, a lot of avenues may be helpful to, to that goal so that if you, if you fear full of one, you have another option. But certainly reporting itself, we've learned, uh, is its own challenge for people. How do you, re how do you reduce people's willingness of fear? And, and part of that would be things like retribution mm -hmm. or things like you know, ensuring their own safety when they do decide to come forward. So every inmate that comes into our custody 
they have an inmate orientation in the new admission house. So as soon as they get to the new admission house, within the 72 hours of being in our custody, they have an inmate orientation, which um, dictates to them how you can report our zero tolerance policy. Um, we also have a mechanism in place that if an allegation is made, that we immediately start monitoring that allegation for at least 90 days. It can be over 90 days, but at least 90 days, we monitor that allegation or that inmate. We go and talk to them and whoever reported the allegation um, to make sure that they're not being retaliated against. And then how do you keep them safe once you guys talked a little about the housing op the housing changes, but how do you ensure their safety if they are reporting against a staff, mm -hmm. for instance, or even somebody who's housed in the same unit as them? There are safety concerns with them. Housing's part of it. I assume there's other parts of it as well. Um, w what is the process taken to ensure safety against things like retribution as mm -hmm. one of them, which is, again, adds to the fear sure. of of reporting. Um, so what are the steps taken to ensure safety, housings included, what are, what are other steps? So let me go back also. Family members, we have a third party reporting mechanism in place as well that's on our website and there are posters up in our visit area and they also report for, for family members that might be incarcerated with us. So um, once an allegation is made, there's a separation order in place either a staff inmate separation or inmate inmate separation. And once we get that allegation within, I would say 48 hours, sometimes even before that, these individuals are, are separated. And for, and how, how, what's the timeline? Within, I would say at least 48, but sometimes even in shorter than that, within 24 hours, they are, they are separated. And how long is that separation order last? until the investigation is over. And then if the investigation's over and they're found, it's unsubstantiated or other, or, or does not meet the threshold, I think it's preponderance of evidence, um, you, that's, that order goes away and they can be then be, the separation order is removed? The separation order is removed. However, we look at it on a case-by-case -case basis because those individuals still may not be in the safest environment if put back in. in and in and how do you, together ensure a conversation with, like the, if, if I feel unsafe, mm -hmm. is how do I report that back to you, that I'm going to be housed in a place where I still feel unsafe? So that's part of the retaliation monitoring process. Uh, the PCM, the PREA compliance manager, and or the PREA ambassadors that are in every facility monitor the retaliation. They go and they speak to the inmate who made the allegation and they determine then whether, you know, if the, uh, if the, uh, if the case is closed, if the investigation is over and they feel like maybe we should monitor retaliation for longer than the 90 days or maybe these individuals should not be placed back in the housing area, we make a determination on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and then what happens to staff? if there's an allegation made against them, and we understand it's an allegation and it's a report, it has to be investigated, but certainly there's a danger if somebody has a, a, an, an open investigation on them. What, what, ha what, is, what, is, what steps are taken around staff if there are open cases being so investigated? I can take that answer. Um, it, when there's an allegation made against a staff member, um, like AC already said, there is a separation <coughs> order between that staff member and the alleged inmate victim. Um, the benefit of the investigation division responding within those first 72 hours to do these interviews is that we are able to prioritize and, and, um, and take whatever measures are necessary with respect to that staff member. So if it appears uh, an allegation of you know, sexual abuse or any criminality, um, that incident is referred immediately to the Department of Investigation. Um, so anytime any criminality is uncovered, uh, that, gets, that gets forwarded to the appropriate authorities, uh, the Department of Investigation, the District Attorney's Office, um, and in certain situations, we will not just separate the staff member from the inmate, but we will separate the staff member from all inmate contact. So, so if there's a, if there's a, it, what is a threshold for saying that you would say no in contact? It is a case-by-case -case basis. It's an analysis that we take. Um, but it, it, it would involve a situation where there's an allegation um, of, a high, of a high level that appears to potentially be substantiated 
Uh, and how many of that, criminal. how many separate, how many staff complete separations were done in 2017? Um, we've done, I would say, probably 20 something. Um, currently, we, we have six people, um, three with no inmate contact. Um, and that's because the remaining of that 20, I believe it's about 26, have either uh, have been disciplined, terminated, or have resigned. So at this point, we, we have a handful of individuals who fall into that category. And are presumably are going through a process right Correct. now of being investigated. Okay, and I'll just a few more questions and I'll, I'll pass it along to the, to the chairs. Um, the, um, you, you talked about the measures being taken to correct uh, um, to and to to address some of the some of the deficiencies or, or or some of the issues that were raised in the report, but I just want to go back to the actual numbers though that were reported in March, which uh, demonstrated a a demonstrable difference and change in terms of reports. And because of I think of a backlog in investigating, I think we still don't know today how many are substantiated or not. So. Can you just give us an update on open cases and on how many have been substantiated from that number last year? Yes, so um, the substantiation rate is, is interesting because with this backlog, um, we had not been able in previous years to close out many cases. So even though it seems the substantiation rate or numbers were low, really it's a question of how many cases were actually closed. We had not been closing many cases because of understaffing. So we have since been closing many more cases, and our substantiation rate is now aligned with the national what, average. So what are the so numbers? For example, um, in, so for example, we've substantiated at this point 44 cases. Out of? From, the, from 2015 allegations. Now, it's important to note that in 2015, we only substantiated two, two allegations because we weren't closing that many at that time. But every year since then, we have increased the amount of cases that we've closed and increased the number of allegations we've substantiated. So can you just do so a number 20, for us? So 2015, yes. how many cases We substantiated two allegations. In 2016, we substantiated eight allegations. In 2017, we substantiated 15 allegations. And this year, so far, we've substantiated 19 allegations. So okay, and can you give us the out of two, 19? Absolutely. So this year, 19 out of how many? So Actually, I think the better numbers to look at are 2015 and 2016 numbers because we were able at this point to close out many of those cases, whereas since we're still in 2018, we haven't closed out that many cases. How many have you but closed from 2018 cases? How many have you closed? Now, is, that 19, is 19 of 20 cases brought mm -hmm. to you in 2018, or is those past cases that have been closed because of new staff? So. We've closed out in 2018, in, well, let me talk about April, because April is when we determined we would be able to have our corrective action plan in place, and in June is when we received additional staffing. Since April, we've closed out an, addition, uh, an additional 316 cases. And those are um, from, from past years? Those include cases from past years, exactly. Yeah. So if you look, for example, at the cases that were closed from allegations made in 2015, there were 219 PREA allegations in, 200, in 2015. 14 of those were closed out as substantiated, and that is a 6.4% substantiation rate. Allegations made in 2016, there were 339. We've closed out 22 PREA reportable cases out of those 339, giving us a 6.5% substantiation rate. Um, so the um, Bureau of Justice Statistics has recently issued a report in July of 2018 analyzing data from 2010 to 2015 nationwide. And their substantiation rate in 2010 was approximately 10%. In 2012, the allegations rose dramatically because of PREA implementation. And despite the fact that the allegations rose dramatically, the substantiation numbers, although they rose somewhat, the rate dropped. And so in 2015, according to the, the Federal Bureau of Justice Statistics, the substantiation rate nationwide was at 6%. So in 2015, in the Department of Correction, 
our substantiation rate is 6.4 percent for that year. Okay, so, so you're on, in you're on, you're in the nation of those six, you know. So the, but the question. So let's just go to a more specific question. Sure. In 2018, are we investigating cases from still from 2015? We are investigating cases every single day, every time. Yes or a case yes, comes maybe a yes or no. Yes or no, 2015, 18, are we closing? We are closing cases from 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And so, so, and then when do we anticipate that a case brought in today, a report made today, will get closed? That depends on the case. As I said earlier. Sorry, let me ask a more specific question. When do we, do you think we are in compliance with the 90 day regulation that if somebody brings one in, 90 days to close out. Okay, that's a fair question. We have a corrective action plan in place that we believe in February of 2019 will allow us to close out the backlogged cases that existed when we testified in front of the Board of Correction in June of 2018. That was the 1,200 cases. The plan is that once we close out that backlog in February of 2019, we will then address what we call that second wave of, of smaller backlog from June of 2018 to February of 2019, which is a, going to be a much smaller backlog. And at that point, we will be in substantial compliance because we'll be able to close out going forward cases within the 90 days. So um, we, timeline. so I, I know you're not going to make a commit. I doubt you're going to make a commitment to adhere to that. But let's say we are sitting here in March of 20. 19 and in fact we just may be there'll be probably be a budget hearing um, and we look at the backlog in 20 March of 2019 mm -hmm. we should anticipate moving forward that a report comes in and we'll, it will meet its 90 day uh, uh, it will be closed out within 90 days we we expect that by March of 2019 we will be at least well on our way to that to that goal because by 2019 in February we have a plan to have already closed out those 1,200 backlogged cases. And so whatever the small backlog is that occurs between the June 2018 and the February 2019 numbers, which will only be a three-month period of backlog, we will be able to handle that much more easily because we will have the staffing that we need by then, and we will have the mechanism put in place to handle it. Okay, and how in your staffing up now? You have 19 today. We actually have 24. 24. We had 19 in June. We hired we hired six. We lost one. Um, okay. And so we have 24 investigators currently on our PREA team. And how many do you need to meet your 90 day? We believe goal? that we'll be um, fully staffed up for our PREA team if we have 30 investigators, and if, and we also would like to. Um, have one or two more supervisory staff put into place, but we're well on our way to making that happen. Okay, I know we've been joined by Councilor Morolich as well. Um, and what's the average day? What is the average um, closing period today? That is not easy to give an answer to because we are closing cases, like I said, that are backlogged from 2015, and we are closing cases that arose in 2018. So it's hard to really give an answer to that question. But there's a there's an answer to that. It's a it's, a, it's a just an average between if it's if it's three days today, and it's 2015, it's 1,200 days. Mm -hmm. There's an I mean there is an average you can do at I mean so so how many how many cases are still open from 2015? From 2015, just one moment. I have that for you. Just give me a second. Uh, I know we, we've been joined by Councilman Lander, too. Sorry. From 2015, um, we still ha we have uh, 241 PREA reportable allegations open. And when do you expect to close those? I'm sorry. Give me one second, please. I, I, I misspoke. Those are the amount of cases that we received in 2015. The amount of cases that we have open in 2015, from 2015, mm. are 21. 21, okay. Yes. And Okay, great. I, I've taken a lot of time, but I will, I will be back. Um, I wanted to pass it along to Councilmember and Chair Rosenthal.
Thank you, Chair Powers. Um, you know, Commissioner, I really appreciate your concern that you expressed at the top of your testimony. And um, I appreciate your intent. I really do. Um, I have to say that um, what, two quick things. One, I think the line of questioning that we just heard and the answers reflect that numbers exist, but they, uh, I, I, as a numbers person, I had a hard time following what you just said. And it, but it sounds like you have some information. So may I ask on behalf of the committees that you send over the information you do have? Uh, feel free to ask whatever, uh, whatever you would like from us, we can provide to you. Great, we'll send over, I mean, I don't wanna play games. I, I really do wanna move on. Um, everything you just said reflects that you have some numbers. I wanna know those numbers, okay? That's it, I'm asking, it's public. How quickly can you get it back? What numbers are you asking for? Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna do this. Um, you just had a very uh, obvious back and forth with the chair of the committee. How, how can you ask me what numbers I'm asking for? Please. We will be happy to provide you, you all of the numbers that we have and even have um, a private meeting with you to discuss them. I do appreciate it, thank you, Commissioner. What I really wanna focus on here today is what the results have been. Um, the bureaucratic questions over the exact investigative prog process and the federal standard of substantiation, all of this is very important, but I don't wanna miss the forest for the trees here. Um, so what I'd like to start with is, um, is if a case is referred to DOI, is it no longer included in the numbers that you report on, and how does it affect your substantiated substantiation rate? It is included. Um, if a case is referred to the Department of Investigation for them to investigate, then we are told to stand down with our investigation, which we do. Um, Any time an individual is found guilty of, of a crime, as a result of the Department of Investigation's investigation and the district attorney's prosecution, that person is terminated from the department. Um, and so it holds, in, it moves from pending to substantiated, just to confirm what you just said. After, yes. After a case is referred out. After a case is referred out and the person okay. is found to have committed a crime, yes. Um, Okay, you mentioned that the decision to refer a complainant for a forensic examination is made by Correctional Health Services. In the last year, how many investigations used a rape kit? Uh, thank you, um, do I need to be uh, sworn in? I think. You're sworn in. Mm do you affirm to tell the whole truth the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond on honestly to council member questions i do um, uh, good morning to uh, chairs uh, powers chairs lanceman uh, chairs rosenthal and members of the criminal justice justice system and women committee and also thank you to my colleagues at the department of corrections uh, commissioner brand uh, chief canty uh, deputy commissioner townsend and assistant commissioner yolardi my name is uh, Zachary Rosner. <clears throat> I'm Chief of Medicine for Correctional Health Services. We oversee the medical care in the jail system. Um, we at Correctional Health Services have a zero tolerance policy for any sexual abuse or harassment in the jails. Um, as caregivers, um, we take this uh, role very seriously. Patient safety is our number one concern uh, and advocacy for patients is one of the main reasons many of us do this work. Um, the question, I believe, was how many specifically rape kits were done uh, in the last year. The number I have is available for 2018. Um, we've referred 27 patients to the hospital uh, in 2018, uh, and I believe the, hosp uh, the forensic evidence collection is completed at Bellevue for men and Elmhurst Hospital for women. There are um, sexual abuse nurse examiners at those hospitals who um, are specially trained in evidence collection. 
Um, and so we have referred, as I mentioned, um, we've referred 27 patients to the hospital and um, forensic kits were completed for 12. Okay. Um, how about the year prior? How about in 2017? Just very succinctly, how many I, cases went to Bellevue? How many rape I kits can, were performed? I can get that information to you. I don't have it at the moment. Um, I would ask that, uh, I don't even know how to respond to that. <laughs> so You don't have so 2017 I have, numbers. I have, um, the numbers I have are for 2018. Did you? <clears throat> okay. Um, I, can, um, I can give you the numbers of reports that we received, if that would be helpful. Sure. Okay. Um, in uh, calendar year 2017, CHS specifically received uh, 775 sexual um, abuse reports. In 2016, we received 524, and um, uh, 2015, 181. Oh, this is helpful. And in 2018, how many uh, reports? Um, I think to year to date, the number yep. is 493. So you've, re you've received over four, uh, nearly 500 and 27 were sent to the hospital. Uh, that, that's correct. The, the 493 includes harassment and uh, abuse complaints. Okay. Do you know of that, how many were rape? Um, so the uh, terminology we generally use is harassment and abuse. Um, the, um, uh, sorry, uh, harassment and assault. We had 221 assault reports to us. That includes any type of unwanted physical touching. Um, so it may not warrant uh, forensic examination. Okay. Um, can we see what a closing memo looks like? Yes, we can provi provide that to you. Okay. And um, is it uh, a checkbox thing or is there um, words? Both. Are, okay. Both. We can provide it to you. Okay. Um, and then uh, your data that we got for the most recent report, um, the data was not disaggregated uh, as to whether or not a survivor was trans or cisgender. Can you provide that information? I will look into whether we can provide that information to you. At when a, um, you mentioned that when someone comes in, uh, there, there's a, uh, they ascertain the, the guard or, or people will ascertain whether or not they need to go into a more protective unit. Is it um, at that time when you might have had the information? Um, I'm sorry, which, which information, whether they are transgender or cisgender? Um, yes. So depending on the time period that you're asking about, we have implemented a uh, electronic screening tool that indicates whether an individual is part of the LGBTI GNC uh, community. And so depending on when you're, what time frame you're asking for, uh, we can give that information. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I actually, I think I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. Um, Oh, wait, sorry, one quick question. How many cases were referred to the NYPD last year? And how many were referred to the DAs? Um, I can get you that information, but anytime um, we do an investigation where criminality is uncovered, we will refer the case to the Department of Investigation and or the Bronx District Attorney's Office. Mm -hmm. um, so do you know, um, we, in the information that you can get us, could you get us, say, starting in 2015, from the time when you know there was a real determination to focus on this, the number of cases in each year that were referred to DOI, the number to the DA, and the number to NYPD? Can you give us so, that information? Just to clarify, yep. every single case, every single allegation that comes through to the investigation division that alleges any sort of sexual abuse of any kind is immediately referred to the Department of Investigation. Every one of them. And for staff, excuse me, yes, for staff, any allegation involving a staff on inmate, sexual abuse of any kind 
is immediately referred to the Department of Investigation. They may, um, and oftentimes usually do, clear us to investigate it, but Got it. immediately it is referred to the Department of Investigation. And so it would be a different type of case that you would refer to NYPD or to the DA, not staff on inmate. No, the department. Well, the Department of Investigation is is the appropriate place to refer these kinds of allegations. Yes, and like I said earlier, if they refer it back to us for further investigation, and we then uncover criminality of any kind, we will refer it back to, oftentimes both the Department of Investigation and the District Attorney's Office to see if they want to take that case again. Okay. Does it do cases ever go to the SVD? in the PD? We will work together um, at any point in time, potentially with the NYPD, but our main liaison is the Department of Investigation. Okay, got it. So you can get us those numbers from 2016. Okay, and I mean, 2015 when you began collecting forward. Sure. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chair Patterson. Yeah, thank you, and uh, Chair Lansman. Thank you. Um, so first, Commissioner, uh, I want to, on the record, and publicly thank a couple of members of your staff who uh, helped me uh, get out of a, a statistical pickle in the last uh, day or so. Uh, Brenda Cook and Alex Ford were extremely helpful in getting us some data that we really needed yesterday, and I want to make sure that you know that. Um, my place at this hearing is my committee in the justice system. We oversee Mock J, we oversee the DAs, um, we oversee the courts, and some others. but. I, I want to focus on the issue of uh, referrals to the district attorneys and the district attorney of the Bronx in particular <clears throat> um, and, and how that relationship goes. So, but let me understand the investigative process as well as I can. When you have one of these allegations, the first call um, outside of the, the Department of Corrections is to the Department of Investigation. Yes. Do you want me to walk you through the process of how we go through our investigation? Is it different? If it, if it, this is different from the testimony that you that you provided? Only with additional detail, if you would like. Yeah. Okay. Um, but for staff on inmate um, sexual abuse allegation, we refer it to the Department of Investigation first. Yes. And and how long does it take them to decide whether they're going to conduct the investigation or it's going to be the department's? investigation division? It's very fast. We get a response, I would say, certainly within 24 hours, usually within a few hours. And uh, are you aware of any criteria or guidelines that they use or that exist that, that um, uh, guide their decision as to who's going to be running this investigation? Well, I wouldn't want to speak for another agency, but we, we do refer those cases to them and we give them the information that we get. I know that's a different. I understand. That's, that's I don't that's know a exactly you don't know. what their criteria is, yeah. um, but they they will ask us to re-refer it back to them if we discover any criminality. Okay, and um, my colleague uh, Councilmember Rosenthal asked about referrals to the to the to the police department. Um, at what point? <clears throat> well, you can't be responsible for for what the department of investigation does. I guess, but at, but at what point does the Department of Corrections, if the allegation is being investigated by the investigations division, notify the NYPD that there's an allegation of what in all circumstances would amount to some crime? If we do uncover criminality, our liaison is to the Department of Investigation. And sometimes if there is a situation, if it requires a crime scene, for example, we will work in conjunction with NYPD. If there's evidence collected, for example, we will establish chain of custody and provide that to the NYPD so that it can then be subsequently vouchered and sent to the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner for their um, analysis. So in that way, we will lay a liaise with the NYPD. So, so let's drill down on that a little bit. So give me the, the, the circumstances when the, the department will or will not um, let the NYPD know that an allegation has been been made. 
I mean, does it have to be substantiated first? Or it does not have to be substantiated or what, first. Just let me finish. Sure. Does it, have, does it have to be substantiated? Does it have to meet some quantum of, of, of evidence that, that, that something really did happen? Or is it defined by the nature of the allegation? Like not every allegation of, of, of sexual abuse or sexual assault um, involves forensic evidence or, or a crime scene, as you, as you put it. So a complaint or a 61 will be prepared for an inmate on inmate allegation of sexual abuse, um, which, is, um, which is referred obviously to the NYPD. The Department of Investigation, however, Wait, is- Sorry, let me just stop you there. Just, yes, right. sure. Is there any kind of um, <clears throat> sexual abuse defined by, by PREA that does not trigger this form 61? Like, like it has to be some certain level within the, or some certain certain level of seriousness? Sexual abuse is a crime. So if it's an inmate on inmate sexual abuse, then there is a 61 generated. Harassment is not a crime. Okay. Well, har certain kinds of harassment could Aggravated be. Aggravated right? harassment could be a crime, but verbal harassment is a violation under the penal law, not a misdemeanor. Right. So those kinds of verbal harassment would not generate this, this form 61? Correct. Okay, so let's keep going. There's a 61 that's been generated. Right. And so those, those situations would, you know, we would involve the NYPD. Now, if there is a crime scene, like I said, that needs to be well, set wait, up. Wait, let me just stop you. When you say involve, is it, the, is it the case that every time there is a Form 61, mm -hmm. which by definition indicates that there's an allegation that a, that a crime was committed, Yes. that the NYPD is notified? Yes. Every case. I will make sure before speaking out of turn because at, I want to make At, at know, least it's the policy that every, yes. that, that every case. Okay. Keep going. So are we talking about inmate on inmate sexual abuse cases? The cases where the 61 is generated. Yes. Go ahead. So those are the cases that we would involve the police department. Okay. Well, yes. well those are the cases you would notify the police department. Correct. Right. So let's, let's talk now about involve, which is a different world. Sure. In, in what circumstances will they be involved, where they will come, where they will, they will do their own investigation as the police department does mm -hmm. and crime scenes and whatever? Right. So I can't speak for the NYPD um, or the district attorney's office, but any allegation that, that arises to the level of criminality will be handled by the Bronx, or if it happens in Brooklyn, whichever the relevant district attorney's office is. And so we will refer those to the um, appropriate agency. And if there is criminality involved, then the appropriate measures are, are taken. Now we, Sorry, know, just, when I'm there's just, other agencies. I'm just a little, conf I'm just a little confused. I'm sure. sure it's me. If, if, you are sending all your 61s or notifying the police department of all your, there's, hey, there's a 61. Mm -hmm. are, do they come and take a look at it or do they wait and not do anything beyond that until they hear from you? No, they, they will not wait for us to, let's say, substantiate a case or, or anything of that nature. So we know the substantiations and, and the issues with that on the, on the department's behalf mm -hmm. and, and DOI's behalf. D do you know of any circumstance where the PD has been notified via this Form 61 or that there is a Form 61 and then the NYPD has acted to make an arrest where the department has not found a substantiation? If I'm understanding your question, are you you're asking if if the Bronx DA or the NYPD has, has determined that there's criminality involved, are there any situations that we disagree? Is that? No, I guess uh, we're getting close. Okay. I gotta make my question better. Okay. <laughs> this isn't easy on my side either, you know. I wanna know if the NYPD ever acts independently of the department and is notified, as they are in every circumstance, or at least they're supposed to be, mm -hmm. that there's a criminal act, do they ever go and effectuate arrest or go and conduct an investigation? Um, or in, is it the case that in all circumstances, they won't act until you have arrived at a decision that an allegation has been substantiated 
and then the cops come in. Okay. First, let me just say that the NYPD does not investigate our allegations. The Department of Investigation does. So that, so if we're talking about the Department of Investigation and liaising with the District Attorney's Office, has there ever been a case where they have found or, su or substantiated something where we haven't? Who's that, they in that scenario? I'm sorry, if the Department of Investigation right. has substantiated so an allegation. What you, I think what you're saying is to a certain extent, talking about the NYPD is not even really the right question. It's a little less relevant than speaking yeah. of the Department of Investigation. Let, the let's, say, let's say a complaint is substantiated. Okay. Right, and you can see that inmate X sexually assaulted inmate Y. And inmate X is gonna be arrested <clears throat> and charged with that crime. Okay. It's the correction officers who will effectuate that arrest, right? And then it's the DA's office that obviously will, will, will prosecute. It's not, it's not like the, NY, the local NYPD precinct comes on the island and, and arrests the person, right? Right. And so, with, and with respect to investigation and discipline, it is my job to discipline correction officers for, uh, for misconduct of any kind, including sexual harassment or sexual abuse. So it's the correction officers that end up going through the disciplinary process through the investigation and trials division. Right. But in terms of the criminal aspect of it, yes. for Rikers Island and, and any of the DOC facilities, the, the model that, that us civilians are used to where if crime is committed, the, the, the NYPD shows up, does its investigation, there's some level of coordination with the district attorney's office or not, and then a determination is made to arrest that person. When we're talking about conduct that occurs on the, on, in, a, in a Department of Correction facility, mm -hmm. the NYPD isn't involved in that way. It is the... We have a, uh, we it have is, you have 11,000 or 10,000 correction officers, and you have the Department of Investigation. Correct. And that kind of NYPD function is, for all practical purposes, fulfilled by some combination of the Corrections Department itself and the Department of Investigation. Correct, and the District Attorney's Office. And the District Attorney's a, Office. Our um, Correction Intelligence Bureau handles um, those types of arrests, and the District Attorney's Office gets involved as well if necessary. They have uh, DA investigators. Good. All right, so my next question, but I, I want it to be, a f to be fair. How, how long have you been in this position? How long have you been in this particular yeah. position? Um, two years. Okay, well that's good. Well, excuse me, I've been at the Department of Correction for two years. I've been in this particular position. I was in charge of the trials and litigation unit. Okay. Um, I'm a former prosecutor. I spent no, no, no. 10 I'm, years. I'm not. I'm not questioning your okay. credentials. I, I just can want, go through my resume. I just, if you'd like. No, I'm sure you're, you're <laughs> eminently qualified, and you're doing a lot better at this than I am. So, um, my question is: yes. Have you noticed a difference in the the seriousness um, in with which these um, these these potentially criminal cases? Mm -hmm have been taken since the Bronx District Attorney, focused on Rikers here, has you know, planted a satellite office on Rikers Island and charged with the mandate of taking um, crimes that are committed, uh, like sexual assault, uh, more seriously and prosecuting them and not allowing them to just kind of be bundled up into the, the whole uh, a criminal case that a person got originally brought with them to, to Rikers Island. Is I, that having an effect? I believe that every, uh, maybe I'm biased as a former prosecutor, but I believe that every allegation that goes through that district attorney's office and any of our city district attorney's offices are taken extremely seriously. Okay, I appreciate that. But in terms of, uh, you're standing up for the team, that's good. I, but in terms of, 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 of on Rikers Island, and Commissioner, or maybe someone else would be better suited because because they've got the before and after view, maybe. Um, but can someone else give me maybe a, a little more precise answer on whether or not the um, satellite office on Rikers Island that the DA maintains has had an impact in how seriously, um, and, and whether or not people are actually getting charged with, with with crimes for sexual assault? I don't think the seriousness, um, the sense of seriousness has changed, but what I do believe is um, we have a very good relationship with the Bronx DA's office because they are on the island. 
and the head of that division was the former head of the trials division. So she's intimately aware of the issues that go on at Rikers, the officers, the staff, all of that. And so what has helped having them there is expediency and the ability to communicate, um, not having to, to set an appointment and wait to get in to see uh, someone at the DA's office, but actually go over to the trailer, talk with someone face to face, they respond to the facility. So the expediency of how these cases are dealt with through the district attorney's office has improved. Right. You know, unfortunately, um, just because of a scheduling issue, the Bronx DA's office wasn't able to be here this morning. And But uh, uh, Judge Clark is going to provide us, we're going to ask her to provide us with um, some written uh, uh, response or information as to how her office uh, is investigating or playing a role in investigating and prosecuting these kinds of cases on on Rikers Island. So, um, but if you could. If I may. Oh, please. Um, our, our division, the investigation division at the Department of Correction regularly liaises with the Rikers Island Bureau. Um, and so the communication lines are definitely there and the appreciation for the seriousness of these incidents is clear. And then let me ask you, and then I'll move off of this, just to follow up on Councilmember Rosenthal's question, if I understood it, but you're, you're not able to tell us how many of these allegations, how many of these Form 61 complaints have at some point evolved into an actual criminal charge against someone for one of these sexual offenses? I can get that information. Can you, if you can get that for us. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, obviously as people have been, been saying, the extraordinarily low substantiation numbers and the uh, lack of closure in so many cases obviously is making everybody very, very concerned that um, whatever might be done to separate a person from another person where there's an allegation, there are questions there, Justice isn't being done in the end, and when justice isn't done, it creates an atmosphere of, of, of impunity. So I would love to see those those. Sure, numbers. and I would reiterate um, that because we do go out within the first 72 hours to investigate initially these allegations, we are able at that point to prioritize cases, and we're also able to assess whether there appears to be potential criminality involved, at which point we will refer those cases back to the Department of Investigation for further um, analysis. So yes, there is a backlog, but all of the cases that are in the backlog have been investigated. The alleged victim has been spoken to and offered all of the potential services that we can offer to that person. The evidence has been collected and preserved, and so it is a matter of clearing this backlog, um, but those cases have been investigated <coughs> and um, anything that arose to a level of criminality is pushed forth to the appropriate authorities. Thank you. Sure. Um, and just for the commissioner, um, under the category of since you're here, uh, Rosie Goldenson is reporting in today's Politico that the department has, quote, reversed course on a once touted effort to house younger detainees separated separately from older adults three years after a rule was passed requiring the separation that relates to the 19 through 21 year olds who we thought were going to be separated and now have been sent back into the general population, which is um, uh, concerning in and of itself. And then one of the reasons for that concern, as reported in the article, is there are real questions about whether they are, aside from whatever safety issues that might be proposed to them, um, whether or not they are getting access to services that 19 through 21 year olds could um, could get. So I, I know we're springing on, or I'm springing on that uh, on you a little bit, but if you could tell us about that briefly, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. I don't know when we'll see each other again. Um, we can see each other whenever you'd like to, sir. I'm always available to you to answer questions. And you, ha you have been, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so I can't comment on the article because I don't know what it says, but um, in summary, we did close GMDC in June, and um, the young adults were moved, for the most part, to RNDC. So while they are in a jail with adult inmates, they are not part of the general population, for the most part. 
um, with the adult inmates. They are separated. And they have full access to the programs that we had in place in GMDC, and we're increasing programs um, to a level that will be um, equal to what they had in GMD. Some things are still being built. For example, we had the Peace Center in GMDC. We had to wait for SCOC approval to rebuild that space in RNDC. So some things aren't in place yet, but will be very shortly. But we are committed to the Young Adult Plan, <clears throat> excuse me, and we have no, no intentions of veering off of that. Just to clarify, when you say you're committed to the Young Adult Plan, meaning getting to a place where they are physically separate all the time from the general population? For the most part, unless they're in special housing, so sometimes they are commingled because they're in a special unit where there are adults, someone over 22, um, but for the most part, yes. So the original plan that we developed, we are committed to maintaining. All right, well, I'll consult with the, the chair of the committee, but I think it might be helpful for there to be some kind of written plan that you can share with the council or share with me, and uh, we can evaluate whether we think that's good or bad and talk more about it. Great. But it is very important, in my view, <clears throat> that these young adults be completely separated in, insofar as it is, is I don't want to say practical, I don't want to say even, you just want to start, unless it's impossible from the general population. It was, it was a high priority of, of corrections reform for a lot of us. Correct. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member and Chair Lansman. Uh, we have members uh, who are here. I have signed up to ask questions as well. Uh, we're, I think, going to start with Council Member Cumbo, Council Member Drum to follow, and then we'll go through the rest of the list. And I think we're going to use the vaunted two minute clock for, for questions. So thank you. Thank you. I had an opportunity to visit the Singer facility, and coming into it, it's very it's very intensive. You can't have jewelry. You've got to check this. You've got to check that. You've got to take all metal devices on. Everything is a door and a lock situation, and there's so much staffing and cameras everywhere. Going on a tour and then hearing what these numbers are, you can't even fathom that incidents such as these could occur at all. Where exactly within the facility are the majority of these cases or, or tragic incidences even happening. And with the level of cameras, scrutiny, officers, where are you finding in the facility that the majority of these cases actually happen? So without having the actual data stand, uh, in front of me, um, I would say in, in the housing areas is where a lot of the incidents are happening. In the shower area is where a lot of the incidents are happening, where the camera is not pointed to the shower area. We can't see, can't see in there. And a lot of the numbers reflect sexual harassment and not necessarily sexual abuse, which we still take very seriously, but it's a higher number of sexual harassment allegations than sexual abuse. But there are still sexual abuse incidents yes. that are happening, and it's yes. showing that it's happening far above the national average. What staff are often involved? Would you say, do you have direct numbers in terms of, is it the, the, the correctional facility staffers? Is it food and maintenance? Is it uh, the cleaning staff? Is it doctors, nurses? Where are the majority of the staffing that is actually um, committing either sexual harassment and or abuse? So it's hard to say where are the staffers, right? I'll, I'll, Not where, but it. which staffers? So a lot of the allegations of sexual abuse come from pat risk, and they're not inappropriate pat risk. Once we finish the investigation to determine what happened, we find that it was an actual, uh, it was a good pat risk. But a lot of the allegations come from a pat risk. Come from a? From a pat, a pat frisk allegation. So if an individual is being pat frisk or, or, or searched, then they make an allegation that they were inappropriately touched. And that is a sexual abuse allegation. So you would say that the majority of the cases are from um, searches and being pat downs? Not the majority, but we're seeing about 20%. So in New York City, they prefer to report it more than any other state? Because if the numbers are higher in New York, are we saying that whatever procedure you're utilizing, people in New York City feel more inclined to report it than not? 
I'm not sure if we could make that connection in particular, but we are seeing about 20% of the abuse allegations, and we're talking about allegations, not necessarily substantiated allegations, but about 20% of our abuse allegations are coming from searches, legal searches. And I know that we're on the clock, so I just want to conclude with one uh, additional question. How many people are fired every year as a result of the allegations? I know Councilmember Lanceman um, touched on that subject, but over the last five years, how many uh, staff, whether it's doctors, nurses, cleaning and maintenance, correctional officers, have actually been fired on an annual basis, year by year, for the last five years. I can get that number to you. It's a specific question, so I can. Well, that's what the you, whole hearing I is will, ultimately about. I will, so I will say that this year, for example, we prosecuted a case all the way through trial. We have a zero tolerance policy. So if we find that somebody um, has sexually, a staff member has sexually abused an inmate. In the trials and litigation unit, we will not offer anything under either resignation or termination. And so either the person will have to resign under those charges or sign an agreement to resign under those charges, or if they refuse to sign in such an agreement, we will take that case to trial and seek termination at oath. For example, this year we had one such case where we had an individual um, where we substantiated a sexual abuse. The individual refused to resign, did not want to sign that agreement. We took the case to trial at oath. The oath, judges, the oath judge agreed that we had proved the case beyond a preponderance of evidence, which is our standard, um, all of the charges that we put forth, including PREA-related charges. However, the judge determined that although we proved the case and that there was guilt, that the determination for discipline would not be termination, it would be 60 days. We have the ability in the Department of Correction to override that through an action of the commissioner. And because we have a zero tolerance policy, our commissioner looked at that evidence and did sign off on an action of the commissioner to terminate that individual, and that individual has since been terminated. So you would say there was one this year? There was one case that we had to take to trial, which we won, and we terminated that person as a result. So one person this year, and it's September, has been terminated. Well, let me say this. In our trials and litigation unit, which is where we prosecute these cases, we only have, I believe, two open cases um, currently pending. So we have closed out these cases, and the ones that we've closed out have either been the, have either resulted in resignation, termination, or a deferred prosecution. And I want to be clear that we're under oath today as well, because this was a very long answer, and I didn't really gain an understanding of what should have been my last final question to get the answer in under the buzzer in about less than 30 seconds. It should have been more of a 2018, two were fired. 2017, mm -hmm. we had three fires, two resignations, one pending. 2016, we had, it should have been more, because that's really what the hearing is about today. These are reporting bills um, on cases of sexual assault and harassment. And if we're really serious about this issue, these numbers should be rattled off of everyone's head that's sitting there today, because if we're saying this is a serious issue, then people that work within the correctional facility need to know that there are serious repercussions and actions that are going to be taken against anyone that sexually assaults, harasses, or any other type of activity that is inappropriate within our correctional facility. The fact that we don't really know these numbers uh, really states that it's not an, an issue that people understand that there are ramifications behind um, that are very serious. So I'll end my uh, line of questioning here and, and perhaps be able to go for a second round. Thank you. Great, thank you. And we're gonna hear from Council Member John. Thank you very much. Um, let me just start off, I, I guess we're on the clock so I don't have much time, but I was just curious in the testimony about how you close out cases from 15, 16, and 17 when it's been three years after, but I'm not gonna ask that question because I only have a couple of minutes. Uh, my, my questions really are, are around the Pat Frisk, actually. So what is the procedure if a visitor is uh, s raising suspicion of carrying contraband? Um, is it that you deny the visit, conduct the Pat Frisk, or keep the visitor and the inmate separated by a glass part partition? Are those the three options?
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honest, honestly to council member questions? I do. So good, good morning, council member Drum. In regards to your question about the Pat Frisk, the visitor is afforded an opportunity to sign a consent form for a Pat Frisk. So they always will have to consign a, a consent form for yes. a Pat Frisk? Yes. And uh, what about glass partition visits? What do you do with that? How do you determine that? Well, it's on a case by case basis. If the um, visitor refuses, the visit can be denied or they could be afforded a booth visit. So how do you determine who gets the Pat Frisk and who gets the glass visit? Are there cases where you suspect people of um, uh, the higher level of suspicion of bringing contraband? Well, we have, um, with the use of modern technology, we have um, phone monitoring now, um, video surveillance. So there's a lot of other but My tools. question is really how, how do you determine who gets a Pat Frisk? No, it's, it's if the person doesn't clear, right? We have- um, when So you, you only do a Pat Frisk after being well, going through a metal detector? Yes. Okay, or some other type of detector? Yes. Okay, I got it. Um, are visitors able to choose the gender or gender identity, identity of the officers who do the Pat Frisk? The Pat Frisk is always conducted by the same gender. And how many, and, and all the people in the room are the, of the same gender or the gender identity? Well, what we currently do is um, we've installed cameras in our um, search areas and the individual is taken to a search area under the supervision of a captain, the same gender conducts the Pat Frisk once the consent form is signed. Okay, are special rooms ever used to conduct these um, searches? Special rooms? Right, where do you do the Pat Frisk? We have a visit search area that has um, video surveillance installed. Um, are bathrooms ever used? No, we do not use bathrooms. Is there any way if, if anybody is in a bathroom and, and, and um, they feel that they're threatened or something, that there's a panic button or something to call for help? A panic button in the bathroom? And they're threatened. Because some of these allegations, I believe, have, been, uh, have occurred in bathrooms, if I'm not mistaken. No, we don't have panic buttons in the bathroom. So it's an unprotected area, right? We don't conduct searches in the bathroom. Okay, but um, sometimes allegations are made that they do happen. Um, are, you're saying also they happen in showers, in shower areas where these allegations are coming from. You, you mix with in inmates, the visits. With just you're mixing the visits. So you're talking about visitors or visit, you know, or our inmates. Okay, so let me just stay with the visitors at this point. But so there's no way that um, and a visitor would be in a bathroom with a corrections officer. No, our policy states no bathrooms. Are visitors ever taken into a room with no cameras and no recording devices? All of our areas and the visitors are under video surveillance. We've installed 13,000 cameras in the department. But they're never searched outside of a camera's view? No, they're not searched outside of the camera's view. Uh, would you provide the, would, can you just describe the Pat Frisk procedure in detail? How does that work? So I have a form here on the back of the form, on the back of the consent form is the actual steps of a Pat Frisk. Can you tell us that? Sure. You know what, why don't you just get that to us, because I know we're going over time here. Okay. But I do have a whole host of other questions that I hope that um, the chair will follow up with, uh, with the panel as well, because we're, we're running behind. So to be generous, um, I will return it to the chair. Okay, I'll show you get to copy this document. Okay, good. Thank you, chair. Thank you, Councilmember Drum, um, and, and we will collect additional questions and follow-up questions to send over in, in response. Um, I, I had another round of questions um, that I wanted to go through. The, fir the first one is, um, just to clarify again, what's the current backlog today of cases? Our current pre-reportable backlog is approximately 1,081. 81, okay. Those are PREA only? Correct. How many are non-PREA? Um, we have, just one moment. And to clarify, I think there was a question earlier about, you know, the distinction between the two. I think the best way to explain that is if an individual makes a one-time 
lewd comment or inappropriate or obscene comment, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that would be considered a non-PREA. Okay. However, we will investigate it and and make sure that it is um, disciplined if, if substantiated. So um, while I'm looking for that number, I will at least give you that explanation. Okay, I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Sure. And again, the question is, how many are in your backlog of non, that are non-PREA? Sure. So I can give you our total, if you don't mind doing that math, our total pending currently is 2,084. So you have 1,000. You have 1,081, right, that are open. So it's about, right. yes, exactly. And 1,000. And do you treat those differently in terms of how you investigate them? The only thing that's treated differently is whatever evidence we have available to us. So for a sexual abuse allegation, the only difference in our treatment of that versus a sexual harassment case is there may be additional evidence that we could collect on a sexual abuse case, physical evidence, um, our you know video evidence might be more robust for a case like that. So we take every case seriously. We investigate every case, um, but there's different evidence that arises from different types. Got it. Of cases. And so on, on evidence for for a second. Yes. If you are closing out a case three years or four years after the fact of it being reported, is there a concern about loss of evidence or, to, or, or evidence being compromised at that point? So that is why it is important for me to reiterate that we do go and collect that evidence and preserve that evidence within the first 72 hours of an allegation. Is there a concern about any, any issue with evidence if it's four years later? Well, I'll say as a former prosecutor, of course I know well and good that the longer a case persists, you know, sometimes you have the issue of um, um, the willingness of, of an individual to go forward or, or the ability to recall specific details. Um, but as for so the it, is it, I want to just, just keep us on track here. The answer is yes. There are concerns about evidence, it sounds like. Anytime we can't um, close out a case sooner rather than later, the longer it takes, yes, there okay. is a concern. I'll take that as a, I'll take that as a, a yes, uh, just with all due respect to, to time. Sure. Um, okay, so concerns about evidence, certainly concerns about, I would imagine, people's re re being able to, and again, I understand you take an immediate, yes. an immediate step to that, but it sounds like to me, within 72 hours, you guys go out, you talk to the person, you collect evidence, you get them services, but then from there, that there's a very long time, uh, and not within the 90-day window. And in fact, the 90-day window is probably so important for this particular issue, is making sure that, uh, that obviously justice is served where needed, but also that you can, you can work through this process in the most efficient way. Is it, is it fair to say that, is it possible that there's, uh, there are, there's, for instance, a staff member who's working there at, in a jail today who has committed a crime three years ago that is still working there and will be found to be substantiated in the near future? Any time there's an allegation that comes to our department of criminality and our initial investigation uncovers that criminality, we refer it to the Department of Investigation for their investigation and then eventual prosecution if, they're, if they substantiate it. During that time, we will take measures that we need to take in order to keep the safety intact. So during that time, we have to stand down. We can't interfere in their investigation. So it is possible that a criminal investigation will continue while we have an individual in the department. However, or, or Yes. Or perhaps, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. But or that we have not even started the process or we've not started. No, I'm sorry. You can, I'm sorry. No, 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 <laughs> go ahead. Correct me. Um, what I, I believe you're asking is, is, is it possible that we haven't been able to uncover that in years and therefore we're going to now discover it years later? No. Because of the fact that we go out within those first 72 hours and we do that initial investigation and if there's you know, any indication of criminality, we will refer it out to the agency and take the appropriate steps within our department to preserve the safety of the inmate. No, I don't believe that that so is the Meaning case. if you guys believe that that person is guilty, that you will say- If there's any, take, if there's Or any some reason, indication that yes. you believe, a high level you believe in indication. Correct. But, the, but there is a possibility. 
that so there would be a substantiated complaint against somebody who's working there today that is from 2016 or 2015. I mean, it's possible. It is possible if the investigation outside of our agency has been continuing That's since that time and then comes back later with a substantiation to us while we had to hold off our investigation. But I want to assure the council that with that staff member, they're not with the inmates. Typically, they're removed, they're modified, and they have non-inmate contact positions. In any complaint? Not in any complaint, but if, typically if the case is with DOI and there's criminality that is suspected and will be substantiated, they're modified. Okay. Um, and, and the last thing I want to say is, and, and I want to get, I know I think Council Member Vera may have a question and others have questions, I know second round, is the, the obviously the concern I've been I'm repeating myself over and over is that I think it is, I think it is a bad legacy for New York City to have left this open for so long and to potentially leave people at risk and at harm. And I understand that we are, and the Board of Corrections, the Department of Corrections, and others are, are taking corrective measures to do that. But it is, I think it should be concerning to everybody that there is, you know, years of cases where, and, and, and uh, a history here. And so um, beyond, I, I, and I certainly would want to continue the conversation about ensuring that we are adjudicating of, of all this quickly. But of course, the, the, I go back to the thing I said at the beginning, which is this is about, also about prevention. Mm -hmm. And are there additional measures that the Department of Corrections is considering to prevent? Do the new jails offer any opportunity to keep more safe? And is there anything that the council or the administration can do to be helpful in the effort to prevent entirely, to get to a, to try to accomplish a goal of zero, uh, uh, certainly zero substantiated, but obviously a, a zero all across the board. So I agree with you. Um, we would like to get to zero as well. I do want to make one comment about the, the implication um, that we are here today and being less than truthful. The reminder that we're under oath um, was unwarranted. We have always been open and transparent with counsel and available to you and providing data that you have asked for. We understand the seriousness of this and that's why we embarked voluntarily to implement the PRIA standards. Um, there are plenty, including ourselves, who don't believe we're where we should be right now um, and we're working on that. Um, but I am hoping that this hearing was about much more than how many staff we've fired. That it's about sexual safety in the jails and implementing PRIA standards and making this city a safe city regardless of where you are. So um, we are using all the tools available to us now. I believe that as we design the new facilities and we have direct supervision in housing areas where you have no hidden um, areas, that that will provide a better opportunity for staff um, and inmates and to contractors and volunteers to see everything that's going on inside a housing area and that um, the sight lines are better not only in the corridors but in programs and housing and rec as well. But we are utilizing everything that PRIA gives us for tools. I think the council has been very supportive. OMB has been very supportive in giving us the positions that we need and we appreciate the support. Thank you, and I have one question, but I'll come back to it. Uh, Council Member Rivera uh, has rejoined us and has questions. Thank you, I'm, I have to step out and perform some land use duties. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony today. And I appreciate you mentioning um, being in compliance with the PREA standards, which is, again, I just want to add that and we're gonna have a hearing on a federal policy that I think most of the council dis disagrees with in a little bit. But I think that as a city, um, and as a city that we claim to be in terms of how progressive and how caring we are about the New Yorkers that live here, and the people that are incarcerated and detained, that we have to aim to be better than federal policies. And so I just also though want to thank you for your work, and I hope that we're always on that mission. So clearly we're all very, very concerned about the length of these investigations and considering the coordination that you have to do with Department of Investigations and with the district attorney. I mean, these investigations could long outlast anyone's actual time on Rikers Island. And so I'm wondering about the correctional health services that are provided to the people who experience this kind of trauma. 
And if you could talk a little bit about um, how does CHS support victims of sexual abuse or harassment, and specifically, do you use doctors with specific training or special training in relation to this type of trauma? Thank you um, for those questions. If it's okay to just jump back to Chair Rosenthal's um, prior point, I was able to get data from 2017. I hope it wasn't uh, uh, perceived that I was being circumspect about any data. Um, in 2017, we had about uh, 775 sexual abuse reports with 29 hospital referrals and 13 forensic kits completed. Um, and again, we can follow up for additional data um, and, and details about uh, forensic kit collection. Um, regarding the health services, I, I agree uh, completely that we are um, aiming to be proactive and preventative in our uh, care and response to reports of sexual assault that we receive. Um, and to that measure, uh, we have uh, taken on the PREA standards and, and are aiming to exceed the, the bare minimum requirements for PREA. Um, our staff have been, um, are being trained, receiving four-hour um, courses, first through DOC starting in 2016, uh, and then we also developed our own in-person PREA training starting in 2018, and we've trained over 1,000 staff uh, on the PREA standards. Um, we have very clear reporting rules um, for when patients come to us with reports of sexual assault. Um, uh, or harassment, uh, and we have uh, templates and clear protocols for our staff to follow uh, and to report it to our operations, uh, where it's then tracked in a database so that we can track these over time. That database was developed in um, uh, the last year um, and is giving us very good tracking data for the reports that we receive. Um, regarding prevention, which I think is uh, probably is the direction here, uh, you are pointing out, um, we also launched a sexual um, abuse advocacy program um, in January of this year, um, which uh, proactively uh, identifies patients who have a history of sexual abuse or who may benefit from ser counseling services. Um, we screen every single person who comes into the jails and has a medical intake for a history of sexual abuse. Um, and can then offer services through this sexual uh, abuse advocacy program uh, to those patients. And so that's for both patients who have not explicitly told us that they've experienced abuse in the jails. Um, it's also for patients with a lifetime history of abuse. And so for that, um, the, the SAA program has been um, uh, a, a big step forward for us and we're very um, happy with the direction it's going in. So just to follow up, so most of the doctors that are on site are primary care physicians or are any specifically have training in regards to sexual abuse trauma? So, um, so yes, uh, we all do this PREA training which is above and beyond and includes our own protocols. Um, we also have 24-7 emergency room doctors who are available for consultation. Um, for any reason, but they also they help uh, during these medical evaluations when primary care doctors are doing it to decide when it's appropriate to refer someone to the hospital for evidence collection um, based on their emergency room training. The SAA counselors are specially trained, as I mentioned, and then the hospitals that we refer to, um, Elmhurst and Bellevue, have uh, sexual assault nurse examiners who are specially trained in evidence collection and preservation. All of our doctors, when they're following our protocols, know to advise patients of the need to preserve evidence. If there is ev any evidence that needs to go to the uh, nurses at the hospital, they put it in a sealed bag um, and it goes with the patient. Um, and uh, just jumping back again to the intake process, every single person who has a medical intake um, is advised of the reporting requirements of CHS and our medical staff. Um, and the resources available for follow-up of any um, reports of sexual assault. So there are nurses, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, if needed? Yes, yes. Yeah, we, we uh, medical sees everybody and mental health services are offered to everyone. Thank you. Okay, and I'm gonna just quickly note, and I'll offer an opportunity to do a second round here, that we are gonna, after this panel, move into the next room because we are long and there is another hearing uh, of the Immigration Committee coming up. Um, did you, okay. Um, I think, do you have another question? Okay, 
Thank you. Uh, as I noted, we will be, um, we'll follow up with some additional questions, some additional data points. Thank you for being here. We are now going to hear from the Board of Corrections. I also just want to congratulate, I know you have a new Chief of Staff who's here as well. It sounds like she's been helping Councilman Lanceman already. Uh, so congratulations to you. Thank you for being here. We will follow up with more questions and information. Um, we are going to take this next door and uh, all are welcome to join us. It's right into the committee room next door. Thank you.